or welcome to everyone, um, fellow master gardeners, people who are interested in shade gardening, and just everyone who's come tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to talk today tonight about summer shade gardening in zone nine. And uh, although there are lots of plants that can grow everywhere, uh, zone nine is a little tougher because of our extremes kind of in temperatures and our humidity down here. So uh, we are going to uh, So Joanne just talked about the Master Gardener Organization. This is basically, um, we are a group that works through the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Office to help promote gardening skills throughout the community. And part of this is uh, what we're doing tonight is this community outreach, uh, education, um, and other programs. We also have plant sales. Uh, we have a website, txmg.org backslash Brazoria, and a Facebook page. Okay, so one of our founding fathers uh, was really a, a, a very good gardener, and he had a, a place in uh, the East Monticello, uh, Thomas Jefferson, and this is a quote from him that I thought was appropriate for um, the gardening today, uh, even today. No occupation is so delightful to me as the culture of the earth, and no culture comparable to that of the garden. So why are we looking at a shade garden? You may already have one, or you may be thinking about um, creating a shade garden, um, but we do have some challenges here. We have sometimes a big trees that create large shady areas, and it's sometimes difficult to maintain these beds. Um, but with some um, plant selection, plant care, bed maintenance, um, we can come up sometimes with a garden that, that looks very nice. Uh, and it also is a nice place to have a, a, a way out of, uh, out of the sun, maybe to sit in this area that you create, uh, except for the mosquitoes here. But other than that, sometimes it's, it's just a nice place to be outside. So why do we, um, so what do we mean by shade? One of the um, definitions of full shade is where there are low branches, there's um, usually this occurs sometimes also on the side of the north side of a, a house or a high wall. And approximately one hour of sunlight is all that gets into a full shade uh, situation. Okay, medium shade, at, there are higher and less dense branches. Uh, there's still not much direct sun, but about three hours of sunlight. A partial or open shade, also known as intermittent shade, this um, kind of shade has uh, about three to six hours of sunlight, and that often occurs in the early morning or late afternoon. So how do we measure how much light or shade we have? Uh, you can do it manually, go out every uh, hour. And since I'm talking about summer plants, typically maybe do this out when it would be June, June-ish, and look every hour to see where the bed is or beds that you're looking at. Um, is it in the shade? Is it in, the, in a place where it's getting a lot of sun? And just mark that down and you can kind of see how many hours of sun you're getting in that area. You can also go with a, uh, a probe. Um, this particular probe on the, le on the left, um, it will uh, you put it out in the uh, area that you would like to uh, check. It will show anywhere from full sun to full shade, and that will give you an idea of what kind of plants can go in that area. The one on the right, a digital readout. Um, these are, are typically used more in greenhouses, but you can also check light from an area with, with a digital readout. And this one is reading 387 lux. And a lux is a measurement of lumens over a particular area. And a lumen is a metric unit of light intensity. So for example, if you would like to plant a, a plant that is going to need a lot of shade, you would probably only go for a plant that has about 1000 lux requirement. Whereas if you went to something that was going to need more um, less shade, it can go up to 35,000 uh, lux. 
and above that up to 60, 70,000 if it's in the um, full sun. So that's the physics lesson for tonight. <laughs> All right. And when you are um, considering a shade garden, there's a few things that you probably need to look at and think about before you attempt this. And one of them, the most probably important one, at least for the plants, is the bed preparation. Okay, uh, the condition of the soil is important when you're planting anything, but in order to find out if the soil that you have is really um, up to speed as far as nutrients, we always advise doing a soil test. And there is a website here where you can download a form. You can also come to the AgriLife office in Angleton and there are bags and forms in the uh, office there that you can take with you. And this test will uh, indicate whether you're missing nutrients and um, you can decide if you need to add more to your bed. Tree roots are usually a, quite a problem under some of our big oak trees, especially. Uh, they can compete with plants for nutrition and moisture, and they can be difficult to work around. But on the other hand, sometimes they are quite beautiful when they're sticking up out of the ground. Uh, normally, if the roots are not um, coming up too far, you can work in about four inches of compost around the tree, and that, that helps retain moisture and adds nutrients and preserves the soil texture. And sometimes you, you just are going to end up having to maybe use a raised bed or large containers if there's just too much um, interference with the roots. If you're planting in an area though that has a shallow root system, um, typically in order to not deprive the tree of oxygen, uh, it's recommended that you only use like two inches a year to um, keep the tree healthy. Once you have your soil to a point where it's um, in a good situation, then you need to think about how are you going to keep this area watered? And as we know with the drought and uh, the heat that we had this past summer, that was something that took a lot of time. Now you can um, uh, do a, a system of, of watering with the soaker hoses or drip irrigation. This is the, of course a more expensive option or you can just stand with a hose and, and just water and kind of go into a Zen mode. But that means sometimes daily, every day having to water uh, in the heat of the summer. You can add mulch to uh, increase the moisture retention. And this could be like pine, pine needles, leaves, compost. We don't recommend hay. Hay often has weed seeds in it. And I guess most of us are already pulling up a lot of weeds right now because the rain's back. Okay, so let's say you have an area that's too shady. Can you can you improve the, the area so that you can get a little more light? Yes, you can remove trees that are um, taking up too much space or fences. You can prune a tree canopy by even up to a third, remove some of the lower branches. And if, in planting, if you plant taller plants in the back and shorter plants in the front, that allows the, the, the plants to get a little more light. Or you could install something like a, a, um, a lattice fence or a fence that has more uh, opens, open area. And if you want to add some elements to the shade area, that also promotes um, space that you can spend more time outside. You can, for example, put in a bench, a swing, a chair, you can add a bird bath or a bird house that can attract um, some wildlife. Uh, a fountain is a nice feature to add more peaceful space. And sometimes um, even a um, using some stepping stones will help in the area so that you can stay off the plants and you can avoid some of the compaction with soil. So I, we realize that not everyone has a yard with um, a lot of space. Some, some of us live in uh, apartments or places that have patios. So there are other ways we can enjoy shade plants by using containers. And these um, containers can be put on the deck or patio. Uh, and if all that's available is full shade, uh, every once in a while, it's a good idea to put these um, planters out into the 
uh, a little less shady area or into the sun for a little while. Um, normally we plant with annual flowers, but they can be um, perennials added to them as well. And this is, um, we can put shade plants in hanging baskets and hang up into our, on, on the patio. And now we're gonna talk about if you want to um, create a, a container, just a few ideas on how to do this. I usually um, find a container that's fairly large that has drainage holes. We um, add soil to up with, within a few inches of the top. And there's a method called the thriller filler spiller process where plants that are fairly tall are put in the middle. There are um, filler plants that are put around the, um, the uh, underneath that and below that a spiller. So in the case of this um, planting to the right, uh, there's a coleus that's used as the uh, thriller. A uh, filler plant is impatience and the spiller is a creeping jenny. Um, it's a good idea to find or use plants that have the same watering needs and uh, give the plants enough space because they will grow over the summer and it may also, again, may be necessary to water every day. And now we're going to start talking about ind um, individual plants. And I, I put them in four categories, annual plants, perennial plants, foliage plants, and herbs. And these are should be successful in zone nine, although this was a very tough summer that we just went through. Uh, I can't guarantee that uh, all of these will survive those conditions. So first we'll talk about our annual fl flowering plants. And one of the first ones that um, a lot of people use and is very pretty are impatience, also known as busy lizzies. Uh, they are uh, tender perennials, but in our area, often they are grown as annuals. Um, you can plant them one year and the next year um, they will sometimes self seed and you might get return plants from the, seed, the seeds. They like to be in the shade. So these are really um, um, either partial shade to full shade with quite a bit of water. They do not like to um, have their soil get too dry. They'll bloom in the spring and the summer and they are often have a wide range of colors, almost a rainbow. Uh, they are pollinator friendly and they come from Africa, Eurasia, and New Guinea. Now, impatience are plants that can uh, actually can enjoy being uh, planted close together. You can even plant them as close as two to four inches, although they will grow um, and, and fill, fill in. They're often used as a border plant because they can um, fill up quite a space. Uh, one of the uh, other widely used plants are wax begonias, and these are also pretty much considered annuals here. Um, if they are um, perennial, they often um, do not like this cold, when some of the cold winters we've been having. Uh, they will do well in the sun as well as partial shade. They do not need as much water as an impatient. They'll bloom in the summer, and the flower colors red, pink, and white, but also the leaf color. Uh, this one in this picture is bronze, but they also come in a very pretty green uh, shade. Pollinator friendly. And this, um, this plant type is also designated uh, as a Texas superstar. And if you are not familiar with the Texas superstars, just a quick definition, they are specifically recognized for their superior performance in tough gardening conditions in Texas. They are usually tested over several years in different parts of Texas and uh, they pass the test and then they are des designated superstars. They usually add one or two plants every year and there is a book that you can, um, a book or you can look online to see which plants are Texas superstars. In the begonia, um, there's a, a type called the Whopper series these fit that category. They are uh, native to Central and South America. One thing about begonias is that the seeds are really, really tiny. Um, they are some of the smallest in the world. And if you were to have um, as a small a, a quantity as one ounce, that could produce up to 3 million seedlings. So it's a very uh, uh, prolific plant. 
The next plant we're going to talk about is Taurinia or wishbone flower. Now I don't have the best picture to show you, but uh, the, the reason it's called wishbone flower is there are two stamens that come together and they form what looks like a chicken wishbone. Um, it's actually a, a very neat feature of this plant. Uh, they're also considered annuals. They are not uh, very tall or big. I mean, they, they are maybe up to a foot tall. They like to be in the shade. They like lots of water and they bloom in the spring and summer. Often these plant, these flowers will come in, in more than one color uh, and they are also pollinator friendly and native to Asia. It's recommended if you're going to purchase these plants to try to get them before they flower because sometimes they won't do well um, if you already have a, a, a wild, a, a, a plant that has a lot of blooms. And uh, they are uh, very, uh, a very neat addition to your shade garden. Uh, the floss flower or the ageratums are another annual that does not get too big. They do uh, do well in full sun to partial shade and they have very shallow roots. So they get can be um, prone to dry out quickly. So they, these you would like to be um, watered at least once or twice a week. They will bloom June to the uh, to the frost time, and they come in several different colors and also pollinator friendly, native to Mexico. Uh, since these roots are fairly uh, shallow, you can uh, dig a, a, a pretty um, short uh, hole. And in some cases where you don't have a lot of soil to work with, these plants would work really well. Next, we're going to move on to another annual of an annual vinca. And these are um, also not real tall. They can spread. They like to be in the sun, but also can tolerate partial shade. They're very drought tolerant and uh, they, um, they are ones that you would probably not water late in the day because that can sometimes cause some fungus issues. They will bloom June to, to frost. Uh, these are another plant that if you plant them one year, you are very likely going to see some new seedlings come up next year. They come in uh, various colors, white, pink, um, mauve, red, purple. They are native to Madagascar. They're friend they are pollinator friendly. And they are another plant series that are Texas superstars if you uh, find the ones that are the Cora series. Um, they can be put in the ground in the spring around the same time that you would put in tomato plants, and, uh, but they do not like cold weather. So be sure to wait until all that cold weather is gone. Okay, are there any questions that I need to address? No. Nope. Okay. So our next set of plants are going to be perennial flowering plants. And these are uh, going to start with coral bells and uh, also known as alum root. It, this is a plant that has a, a wide range of uh, colors in its leaves and flowers. It can tolerate shade, a lot of full shade or even partial shade. Um, they uh, need about an inch of water a week. And sometimes during those extra hot days, it's probably a good idea to water them even more frequently. They will bloom in the spring and summer, and uh, they are also pollinator friendly and native to North America. Uh, if you would like to have more leaf growth, uh, you can wait until these flower stalks um, are spent, cut those off, and that will usually encourage the plant to produce more, leaf, more uh, colorful leaves. Another plant that is um, relatively easy to grow, uh, Arxalis or, excuse me, a purple shamrock. Uh, these are uh, uh, kind of neat in that if you look at the plant itself, you'll see that there are three leaves that gather together. And the, people describe this as almost like three butterflies that are nose to nose. Uh, they are uh, quite um, uh, pretty in that they have, uh, a real contrast between the white flower and the purple um, uh, leaf. Uh, they do come though in a couple different 
flower colors. Uh, they can be white, pink, or lavender. You'll see in a lot of these um, slides as I go along that uh, these uh, perennial flowers tend to be pollinator friendly, but often toxic to people and pets. So it's just the nature of some of these plants that um, if you have pets, you just have to kind of beware of what uh, toxicity they have. Uh, so the, the oxalis leaves will turn towards the light during the day. And as it turned, as the, uh, the day comes to a close, the leaves might curl up a little bit. And um, there's a question from Brittany. She's asking, uh, do these, does this plant survive really cold weather? This, this is a plant that it will um, sometimes die back, but it might return in the spring. Yeah, and I can add to that because I have that in my backyard. And okay. it, it I, I've never, it looks really sad in a freeze. It will really knock it all the way back. And then at immediate, I've never lost it. It immediately pops back, like you said. Yes. It's a great perennial. Yeah, and I think anyone, any of us who have the uh, the wild form in our yard, that, uh, that there doesn't seem to be much that will um, take care of that. But it also has a kind of a pretty pink flower, but it spreads everywhere. And Brittany, so, mine, mine, she's asking, she's thinking about putting it in the ground. I guess she has it in a pot. Yeah, Brittany, I have mine in the ground and, and I've had it for years and years and years. Yeah, it's a pretty, very re a reliable one. Yes. Um, as I go along, uh, the ones that are not hardy for zone nine, I, I will talk about that. There's a few that aren't, that you will probably not be able to keep them in the ground all year. Okay. So our next plant is a columbine. This is a... Uh, herbaceous perennial. They can be up to three feet tall. They can handle either a full sun or partial shade, a moderate soil moisture. Uh, in spring to summer is the bloom, although I have I have this growing in my yard and uh, it, I, okay, and it is from the Texas gold. A plant is the one I have and it will bloom, but as soon as it starts to warm up, uh, the, the blooms are done. Um, they but it does make a really pretty yellow flower. Um, they also come in other colors, red, orange, yellow, blue, a lot of different colors. Uh, I lived, we lived in uh, Colorado for a while, um, back when my husband was getting some of his degrees and we would often spend our weekends hiking in the mountains and columbines grew wild up there, just everywhere. So I, I was very delighted to find out that you could grow a columbine in Texas. Again, this is a pollinator friendly plant that's toxic to humans. Um, it can take a while for it to bloom. It took mine a couple years really to have many blooms. And uh, they look sort of like jester's caps, very delicate um, and I think very cheerful plants. Uh, the next plant is a spider wart or also known as a day flower, uh, another herbaceous perennial. It can get up to three feet tall. Another one that can handle a whole range of uh, sun from full sun to full shade, drought tolerant. Uh, it does um, best in the moist soil, uh, but it needs to be watered in the, those hot days of summer. It will bloom in the summer and spring. And there are a couple different colors. Uh, yes, pollinator friendly. North and South America and Central America is where this one is um, natively found. Uh, okay, this is the, the name day flower comes from the fact that the flowers will open early in the morning and by early afternoon, they will already shut. They'll only bloom once, once, and then they're done. So, um, but there are a, a number of plants that do that. If you want this plant to kind of rejuvenate after it's had, you know, some tough summer uh, weather, you can cut it back and it will come back sometimes again in the, the later part of the season. Hydrangeas. Um, hydrangea is, uh, is a more of a shrub, a deciduous shrub, but it's something that can be planted under a, tr under a, a, a large tree, uh, although they can get to be fairly tall if they are in the right condition. They can handle some shade also do well in full sun. I will tell you though that I had one in a pot and when I had it in full sun, it 
was okay, but as soon as I moved it into the shade, it perked up. So I'm I'm saying probably in this part part of the world they do not like all the full sun that we get. Uh, they like consistent moisture, and they will bloom midsummer through fall. So if you have them now, and if you're able to keep them over the summer, they may may start to bloom again. There are various um, species have different colors of uh, flowers. Uh, so, you know, it will depend on what species you have. They are pollinator friendly, again, toxic to humans. Um, if you want to play with the pH of the soil, you can sometimes change the color of the bloom. If you can go to our, towards an acid soil, that will create more of a blue color. And if you use um, or have soil that's more alkaline, that tends to um, promote more of a pink color. So that's something if you'd like to try. Okay, I think I missed one. Nope, gotta go back. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to move on to um, uh, something called a tractor seed plant, which is another name for a leopard plant or farfugium. Um, they're called tractor seat plants because, I mean, they actually sort of look like tractor seats and some of them can get to be quite large. Uh, this is a perennial plant. It um, can, can tolerate some morning sun, but it prefers shade. Uh, it'll droop if it's out in the sun too much. So it's a good thing to keep the soil fairly moist. And like I said, these plants, it can produce some pretty large leaves. This is one that has a, a bunch of different varieties to it. Yes. You'll see it out in the garden centers. And my experience with it is one of the better plants for shades because it's big and, and, and likes the shade. But also, um, uh, it seems to survive very cold temperatures. Mine has come back every year with these couple of bad freezes that we've had. Yes, and then, and our... our good friend Joy Har Hargett, she um, actually gave me some of the information on this plant and she said that it tolerated very cold temperatures back in during that winter storm Uri in 2021. Yeah. It survived even without cover and without. Mine did too. Yeah so um, this isn't a, a plant to think about. It um, has a nice look to it so if you're looking for something with a interesting leaf um, it, it's, it makes a little bit of a show with the leaves. Yeah. Yes. I apologize also for the, um, the arrangement of these slides. It, they got scrunched a little bit. So some of the, the, the um, uh, text is not all there. But uh, anyway, sorry about that. Yeah, that Linda's voice is there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there are these um, pretty yellow blooms on the stalks. Uh, and they are the the leaves are can be they can be plain green or they're spotted, uh, large or small. And uh, Joy says that they can make some offspring that can be planted elsewhere. So um, again, pollinators like it, uh, toxic to humans, and it came from you know Japan, Korea, Taiwan, uh, that area. So a, a really neat plant, one that I have not tried, but I'm going to. Okay, so now we're going to move on to a couple lilies. This is a crinum lily, which is not a true lily. The, these are perennial bulbs, which can get to be quite big, um, up to seven feet wide. They like a, a bright filtered shade. They like to be moist, but not soggy. And uh, they are relatively drought tolerant. The flower colors are, are uh, various colors, white, reds, pinks. Um, I have one that's a, a white and red. I think they call it peppermint or something. Anyway, that's a very pretty one too. They like to be um, crowded together. So you can plant more than one bulb at a time. The pollinators like them and they come from the warmer parts of the Americas. It's a, it is a tropical kind of plant. Again, a toxic plant. Um, they can be put in an area and left there for decades. Uh, they, they do not need much care. And that flower stalk that you see um, contains usually many, many um, buds. And so you may have flowers that last for a week or more because the, the, 
the individual flowers will only last for a day, but some of the buds will keep blooming. So they are a, a very um, useful plant in the shade. Another lily that uh, is used here in the South, a calla lily, uh, is one that um, can get to be about three feet tall. It can handle the shade or the sun. Uh, it doesn't like to be soggy um, because the stems may rot. And this is especially true if you have this plant in a pot. I, I know that um, if it gets overwatered, it does not like it. It will bloom in the summer. And there are uh, um, several different colors of the bloom. And again, the pollinators like this, this plant. Um, it does have a nice fragrance. And if you um, plant this, it's probably best to plant it in groups. These are, some plants just are very friendly. And this one is one that doesn't mind having other bulbs close to it. You can plant them in a circle or in a triangle, just um, someplace where they're close together. Pentas, also known as the Egyptian star cluster. Uh, a penta, if you look at the individual flowers, have five um, petals, so hence the word penta. Uh, but these kinds of flowers are great for butterflies because they, they sort of have a, a landing pad for the, um, for the insect and they like this, this formation. I have uh, one of... Um, the taller type of pentas in my front yard, and um, it really attracts the butterflies in the summer. They can get to be fairly tall. Um, the one I have, like I said, is a taller version. Uh, they don't mind being in the shade, but they also can handle some sun. They're drought tolerant. Um, I really don't do anything to this plant, and it, for me, it, it has done well for, for years. It comes back every year. It has survived several freezes. Um, it will bloom in the summer, and you can have a, a variety of colors with this plant. Pollinator friendly, again, it is in the superstar family and native, native to Africa. Uh, it will um, tend to grow fairly neat and compact, but if it does start to get kind of woody and um, overgrown, you can cut it back and it will rejuvenate itself from a, a trim. Another plant there that um, is able to grow in the shade is called crossandra or a firecracker flower. Um, I uh, have a, a neighbor in where close to where I live in Lake Jackson that they put in a new bed and this was one of the plants they put in and it was beautiful when it was in and I thought, oh, that's probably not going to survive. They'll probably have to replant it. But it survived a freeze and came back the next year. So it will handle, um, uh, it can be a perennial here. Uh, they are, do not get that big um, and they like to be in the shade. Uh, they don't like to be though um, without water. So they like to have moist soil and it uh, will, bl will bloom in the spring, summer and fall because the blooms will keep growing. As, as, it, um, as this plant blooms, the bottom ones will dry and it will keep producing blooms towards the top. Uh, they can come in a couple of different colors. And again, they are uh, pollinator friendly. Um, you might also grow this one in a container, but it does grow fairly fast. And in about a year, it would probably need to be uh, up, uh, potted into a larger pot. Okay, another plant that uh, grows well in the shade is yarrow. And this comes in many different colors and uh, also many different names. Um, it's a herbaceous perennial. It can get to be two to three feet tall and wide. It normally grows in the sun, but it will tolerate some shade. So uh, it does not need a lot of water and it will bloom in the summer and fall. It has quite a wide range of colors. Um, most typically, I think the, the wild type is, is a white one, but there have been many uh, combinations created since then. It's pollinator friendly. Uh, although it does say that it is toxic, um, it does have a use medicinally and has been used uh, since really ancient times. Uh, 
during a, some, some of the battlefield wars, it was used to help stop bleeding. But if you um, look at how it's used medicinally, there's a whole list of things it's used for. So it's a, it's a plant that can also be um, dried. You can cut that, the top uh, flower off and dry it and use in different arrangements. So you can enjoy it for even longer. We had a question, uh, Joy, Joy's on. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Hi. Um, she, she was asking, do you, uh, she was back on the pintas. Uh, do you cut back your pintas in the late fall before freeze? What do you, how do you do that? What do you do? Um, it, it really depends. This one, I, um, I cut it back after it, you know, the winter. Um, and then by the springtime, it'll start coming back up from the. That's what the, I was thinking. Yeah. Just leave it go. I leave it go. Winter. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of times, what a, I would do. a lot of plants actually benefit from um, not being cut back right away. So, yeah, if you can tolerate the brown. So I'm going to get to a plant that I'll talk about brown. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right. uh, Lobelia. Uh, this is uh, something that is uh, not that big. It will only get to be maybe nine inches tall. Uh, it, it can handle full sun to partial shade. It likes to be well drained though. So it's not one that you want to put in a pot that doesn't have good drainage holes. It will, it will bloom in the summer and fall. There are various colors of this plant, anywhere from blue to even a white and red. It comes from South Africa. Uh, it's another pollinator friendly plant. And um, the native Indians, and that, this is another medicinal plant, uh, native or indigenous peoples, um, use this, uh, they smoked this uh, plant to help treat asthma. Uh, it works well in uh, hanging baskets because it does have sort of a, a trailing uh, habit. So, but it, it, it's one that I think is, is also very pretty, especially these ones that are with the, the two colors, the white and the blue, it really stands out. Our, our next plant is called Texas Betony. This is um, uh, one that if you look, it's native to the Texas Pe Trans-Pecos region of West Texas. So this is one that because of where it comes from is pretty drought, drought tolerant. Uh, it likes well-drained soil. And so this is one also that you wouldn't let soak, um, you had, have to let it drain. It will bloom from summer to fall. And these, apparently these, um, I have not ever grown this myself, but in the description of the flowers is that they're very, a very scarlet red flower with a gray green foliage. It sounds like a really pretty plant. Um, it's suggested that um, if it gets ragged, you can prune this one back and uh, it will produce new flowers. Another uh, pollinator friendly plant. Okay. So we have now moved on to um, the section of foliage plants. Now, all of us, a lot of us like flowers, but there's also a whole range of plants that have beautiful leaves that can be used. They may have flowers, but the flowers are not very significant normally. So these plants are ones that will add um, some color and depth, even with their leaves to your shade garden. So the first one, Often, um, when we think of shade, we think of caladiums, um, also known as elephant ears, but there's another plant a little bit later that I'll talk about that are, we really know as elephant ears. This is a tropical perennial. Uh, they can get to be um, a foot or, or to almost two feet, three feet tall um, and 12, about two feet wide. So they, once you do have them in the ground, they, they can take up some space. They do like to be in the shade. Uh, the sun will definitely burn these leaves. They uh, can be grown in pots, but again, um, they need to be well-drained. Um, if there is a flower, it will come out in the spring or summer or fall. Uh, it has a couple different colors, but again, we grow this plant primarily for its very pretty leaves. It's native to Central and South America. And again, it's toxic. Um, it's it, it is cold tolerant, so once you plant it, you can leave it in the ground in South Texas. Uh, the designs of these uh, leaves are um, 
very pretty, different bite and different colors. Uh, again, in my neighborhood, I um, walked by this place last year. They had planted um, white with pink uh, leaved caladiums and pink pentas together. It was really striking. I really thought, wow, that, that was an eye opener. This year, that same place has planted red leafed caladiums and white pentas. Again, just you, you get the color combination together and it was, it's really pretty. And it's again, it has survived this summer. Uh, the um, soil, it likes to be uh, rich, well drained, and you don't need to fertilize these much. Uh, if you, um, Notice that they die back in the fall, that's fine. They will come back again in, in the spring. So these are uh, used all over this part of Texas in the shade. Another um, shade plant that works well here is a uh, coleus. Uh, these can grow to a foot or more. They have kind of a velvety appearance with their leaves and they have a lot of different leaf colors and combinations of colors. Uh, it does not, like to be in the sun too much, really prefers the shade. Uh, again, well-drained soil. If it does become droopy, and I know this summer uh, several of mine did, if I went back and watered them, they just perked right back up, so. They like to be pinched back and, too. Have yeah. you noticed they pop right back? Yes. Yeah, you're there. I'm We're gonna talk a little bit about that, yeah. Um, they're fairly disease-free. And this is again, all thanks to Joy. Um, <laughs> you can propagate these by um, taking one of the stems and putting it in water and it will produce roots fairly quickly and you can plant, uh, uh, have another plant fairly easily. If you want to continue to see a lot of foliage, it's best to pinch off the flowers, which are not really the, not that significant, um, that will conserve some of the plant's energy and they'll produce more leaves. Uh, but if you do let it go to flower, the pollinators like this one too. Uh, although um, leaves are poisonous to, uh, to humans. I'm not sure about other plant, um, pets, but uh, yeah, even though they're very pretty, you just we just look at them. <laughs> okay, so now we're actually gonna talk about what we think of as the elephant ear plant or Amazonian elephant's ear. Uh, this is a very, a tropical perennial. Uh, it says here one to two feet tall, although I think they can get taller than that. Yeah. Uh, they can have uh, um, uh, be they can uh, endure partial shade. They are drought tolerant, but they also need well-drained soil. You may need to water them periodically. Uh, if you uh, look at the different types of leaves, they come in lots of lots of varieties and colors. Um, if you uh, want to promote more leaves, they suggest that you uh, pull the leaves off the bottom that will produce more, more leaves. Uh, also, this is um, um, my uh, cheat sheet. Um, it's one that if you uh, put, plant the bulb in the spring, it will become um, adapted and then it will overwinter and come back again in the in the spring again. So it, it's one that you can keep for several for years. When you say pull the leaves off the bottom, right? They said pull are those the newer leaves or the, the older, older leaves. leaves? Pull older. the older leaves off the bottom. And that will promote new leaves to grow. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So continue. Okay, so um, one of the, the plants that can be grown in the, a hybrid, a natural hybrid uh, that is a perennial, it can grow, your connection is unstable. Okay, um, it can be, uh, get to be three to four feet tall and about that, that same width. It can handle both full sun to full shade. It likes though to be um, moist, but not overly watered. Uh, it's native to North America and it is um, toxic to cats and dogs. Uh, and it has a very upright form. A lot of ferns tend to get sort of flat. This one will remain more upright and the leaves are, or the fronds are quite uh, green and wide. 
That's a, a very pretty fern. Another fern uh, that's planted frequently is a foxtail fern or asparagus fern. Uh, these are uh, ones that can also get to be fairly tall that will tolerate partial shade. Uh, and it will also um, handle uh, being in a, a drought drought area because it can handle um, the minimal watering. This plant has tubers that store water and which it can be good or bad because it's a plant that can, uh, because it's so uh, adapted, it can take over an area and it's really recommended that you either you um, keep this one in a container or put it under a, a tree that has really established roots so that it won't take over other plantings. Uh, it will produce a flower in the spring <clears throat> and it will turn into red berries that birds like. It's and it's pollinator friendly. Um, it will, um, yeah, it it will uh, eventually take over. I uh, I have dug sometimes one of these plants out and the tubers are uh, are very difficult sometimes to get rid of if you really wanna get rid of the plant. Okay, another plant that's often grown in the shade is a, a liriope. There are a couple different um, species of this plant that are uh, found um, that work well. It's a, another herbaceous perennial. It does not get to be that tall, maybe a foot and a half. Uh, it can handle both full sun and partial shade uh, and also does not need uh, a lot of water. It will bloom these very um, either white or purple uh, spikes in um, August to September. And uh, they it, again, the, um, it is pollinator friendly. And this is uh, because this one does tend to um, spread a little bit. It is suggested that you plant them at least a foot apart. And uh, you, there are people who will just, and as it turns into winter, will uh, take their lawnmower and just ro roll over this plant. It can handle that. In the spring, it will come back up. Um, you can shear it also by hand, but the lawnmower seems to work pretty well. Hostas, okay. So this is um, also called a plantain lily. Uh, they come in many different colors and sizes. Uh, most of the time though, this is one, a plant that really does like to be in the shade. I have the variety uh, that's in the top um, picture uh, in two pots in my, uh, by my front door. And this year, because of the, the heat and the drought, I mean, I did water it, but I think the heat was just so much more intense. The leaves did not get as big this year and it didn't flower, but typically, in, in the right conditions, these will flower, although the flowers are not, you know, a, the main reason these are plants are grown, but they will produce a flower. Um, they, they do like to be watered about an inch a week. Uh, they bloom in the summer and pollinator friendly. Now, if you want to grow something like this very pretty um, uh, yellow leafed version, that one you would have to put out in the sun part of the time because that color is produced with a with the help of the sun. So, um, but normally these plants do just fine in the shade uh, because again, if you have one that, I mean, can get to be quite wide, you may have to think about how far apart you're gonna plant them. Some of them one to five feet even. Uh, this is one plant though that uh, it's easy to propagate because all you need is a piece of the root. And if you put that in a pot, it can grow another plant. So this is a, a, a one that you can keep going. Do you think the um, the yellow, the one that's yellow and green that you have, do you think if it was in a, if I had something like that, you know, we all, a lot of us have those big oak trees in our front yard because the city, yes, is what they plant, the tills plant. It, and if they got the morning sun under the oak tree, do you think that would be enough? To that give it some color? Good? Yeah. Yes, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay, a juga or bugleweed. Um, this is more of like a ground cover almost, but it it's uh, because it doesn't get to be that tall. Um, it likes to be in, in uh, the sun, but it also can tolerate shade and it is also drought tolerant. 
This one has a, a, a very pretty um, dark, dark green leaf and uh, blue or violet flowers. Uh, the pollinators also like this. Uh, this plant, um, it tends to spread with um, underground stolons. So if you're going to plant it, it just beware that it can take over a space. Uh, it is though used sometimes for in, uh, erosion control. It can be planted on slopes or banks or even under trees where nothing else will grow and uh, it will um, spread and, and look actually quite nice. Uh, it, uh, it does like have to have well-drained soil and it doesn't bloom all year. It does bloom though from May to June. Okay, and now we move on to a, a croton or a, a, a plant that is another shrub. But oftentimes when we grow them in pots, they, they don't get to be the shrub size that they can be if they were in their regular hardiness zone of 11A to 12B. And because of that, in our zone, we actually need to protect these. I mean, they make great outdoor plants in um, containers, and a lot of people put these by their um, by their front doors because they're very colorful. Uh, but if you want to keep them all winter, uh, probably if you know there's going to be cold weather, you probably have to bring them inside into a garage or, or another space. Uh, so these these leaves do um, the the leaves lose water easily, so probably you need to keep the watering um, consistent, and but not uh, at the base of the plant because that can produce uh, some fungal, some fungal issues. Uh, it is um, frost tender, and so um, another thing it does not like to um, have done to it too often is uh, to be transplanted. So if you have it in a pot and it's happy, uh, just leave it there for a couple of years before you plant it into another pot because it is stressful for it to be transplanted. Another plant that is pretty tough is a, a cast iron plant or its other name, a bar room plant. I think that's a, a cool name. It's a, a perennial, can get to be two to three feet tall. And this is one that does best in the shade, partial or full. Uh, it does not need a lot of water, uh, but uh, it, it will, um, uh, if it does dry out, it does need to be watered uh, again, and then it'll last for quite a while before it needs a, a repeat water. There is a bloom. Uh, it can bloom a, a, a little flower that is either white or purple, and it is a native to Asia. Now it comes in a, a number of different um, uh, leaf uh, shapes or leaf um, colorings with the spots or the stripes. Uh, it's a, a plant that um, is quite tough and it does not need a lot of maintenance, but it is not cold hardy. So um, it, it can take a couple of years to reach full size, but if it does get frozen or um, the winter is tough, it will come back. Um, I have had, I have a couple plants that come back every year. So, but it, it will, the cold will stress it out. Okay. So peacock ginger, or also known as resurrection lily, now that when we talked about brown leaves. So this is one that um, the, the drought and the heat was really hard on this plant. A lot of the leaves shriveled up and curled up and it just looked really bad. So I went recently and pulled up all the dead leaves and um, it's coming back, it's looking good again. Um, it does have these little, these pretty little purple flowers. Um, it's also, it's known here as the um, the hosta of the South, because I guess some people had a, an, an impression, I guess, that hostas don't grow here. So this is what they replaced it with, but you can grow both. So this can handle um, the partial shade. It does not get to be that tall, only about a foot tall. Um, it uh, does like to have some moist, well-drained soil, which is maybe why it didn't handle the drought too well. Uh, but it will die back in the winter and it'll return in, in the spring. And those little blooms come out in the summer, uh, native to Asia. Uh, and uh, it's, 
And the, the foliage is, is also quite pretty. It has some different uh, striations in it. Bromeliads, this is a, a huge group of plants. Uh, it includes things like the air plant that you can buy where you basically, it, it, it can be just put inside a, a pot without any soil. Um, it includes also things like the, the pineapple. Um, this, these plants can do anywhere from full sun to full shade, depends on the variety. They're drought tolerant. Um, you would put water in, if they're in a pot, water until the water comes out of the drain holes. And if they're in the ground, um, you keep the, the top um, of the soil moist. Rainwater is um, the best for these plants. Uh, they bloom once and then uh, that bloom will die and that plant will die. But this is a plant that um, can regenerate from little plantlets around the base or little buds. And if you wait long enough, you'll have another plant and another bloom. So it will keep producing. It is pollinator friendly. Um, again, this is one that it does not really do an overwinter in our zone. Uh, normally these would be planted in a pot. Uh, I do have some in, in my, that I've had in the ground for a couple of years, but every year it seems like it takes a little longer for them to come back. So they probably are best in a pot. Um, they uh, another little interesting point about these plants is their roots are really more for balance. They don't actually get that much nu nutrition from the roots. They get the nutrition from their leaves um, and water actually through their leaves. So a lot of people will um, put a little bit of water in the, the neck of the plant and they're quite happy that way. I have one more. Age plant, and that is causes it can get to be about four feet tall. Um, it is often grown inside. You can have it outside in a a, a pot or even in the soil, but um, it it uh, is a little bit more of a drought tolerant plant. Um, it will it does have a flower. It will bloom in the spring. Native to East Africa. It's this one's only mildly toxic to humans. I guess if you take a bite of this one, it won't won't be as bad as some of the, the other ones. Um, this can actually tolerate long periods of time without um, water. And uh, people sometimes say that because of its glossy leaves, it almost looks like a fake plant because it it, it just um, that's just the nature of how it looks. Okay. So we have I've looked at a lot of plants already. I have a couple more. How are we doing on time? You're right at eight o'clock. Right at eight o'clock. Talk about herbs for just a few. Okay, minutes. I'll just run through herbs real quick. Okay, so if you want to plant herbs in the shade, it, just a couple tips on maybe how to have a little more success. Uh, pinch back the leaves often. That helps them grow uh, a little more compactly. Uh, they're more pest likely to be attracted to the plants. If they're not in the sunlight, just be aware that, that they might be attracted. Um, if you uh, allow the plants to flower, they will uh, uh, in, uh, introduce more pollina uh, pollinator, uh, pollinators. And if you don't fertilize as much, they won't get quite as leggy. Uh, talk about parsley. Uh, there's either the flat type or the curly type. Uh, they can grow in partial shade. Uh, you need to water very deeply um, and then let it dry out. This is a, a true biennial, a biennial in that the first year, if you can um, let it grow and then go through the, the second season, it will produce a flower the second season, but then it will die. They come from the Mediterranean. Parsley is used in a lot of different uh, plant, uh, dishes. Mint. Um, comes with lots of different kinds of mints. Uh, they can handle some partial shade, like to be moist. Um, uh, though a tip with mint is, unless you would want it to spread everywhere, we really recommend that you put it in a pot. Uh, it, it does spread with underground stems everywhere and can become invasive. Um, it's native to quite a few areas of the world. Uh, another one is our the sweet basil that we use in pasta and pizza and uh, other pesto. Uh, it can be grown 
perennial or annual. I, it seems like I just pulled up a bunch of basil that was just done. Um, but they're, underneath the plant, there are hundreds of little babies. So, I mean, it, it will produce forever. Uh, it likes to be in the sun, but in our hot climate, it can tolerate some shade. Um, again, watering can keep the plant happy. Uh, it will bloom if June to frost. If you pinch the blooms back, you'll have more um, tender leaves. Once it blooms, the, um, the leaves be start to become bitter. Thyme is uh, a smaller plant. It can handle a little bit of um, shade again. It also is drought tolerant and it can come in many sizes and shapes. Um, you can even put it between pavers if you have a sitting area. Um, you can actually almost walk on this stuff. It's fairly tough. Okay, um, where do you find these plants? You can get them, start them yourself from seeds, roots, bulbs. Uh, you look for them in local nurseries. You can propagate them from stem cuttings. Uh, we, uh, we have plants available sometimes at our um, Master Gardener plant sale that will fit this category. We share with family and friends. Uh, there's, there's lots of ways to get the plants. Um, I just put a quick um, uh, slide here about what plants are drought tolerant, which prefer moisture. Uh, they're it will help if you have different areas with different needs. This is just a, because I didn't do them alphabetically. I just created a slide for where you can find the, the plants. Uh, there's a list of the websites and books and people. Uh, okay, that um, I use to create this um, presentation and I am signed out. All right. Thank you, Linda. This was awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>